All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to James chapter three, verse five. How did you do this week watching your tongue? I did really good on Monday. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's a Tuesday. But it's an eye opener. I hate that I speak so much. And the Lord is right. We do a lot of dumb stuff with our mouth, don't we? Especially driving. I have a rumming commentary on drivers. <clears throat> My wife tells me. What is that idiot person doing? James, as Jesus' half-brother, was the first pastor of the church. All Christian Jewish believers early on. Stephen was eventually murdered for his faith and the persecution against the church began in earnest in Jerusalem and the church was, was chased out of town. Now that kind of furthered God's plan that they weren't all just stay in one place. The word was to get out. But on the other hand, James then wrote to his congregation, which was fleeing. And his concern was really singular. He wanted them to do well spiritually. He wanted them to see or to show that their faith in Jesus was real, not just a discussion, but a life. And so <clears throat> James writes this letter maybe a dozen years after Jesus ascended. It is the first book in circulation of the New Testament books. It is usually people's favorites, if you, especially if you like to get hit in the head, because James kind of swings at the spiritual chin of man. He's not interested in, in the things that we would normally talk about where we would want to grow. He's interested in hard issues of things that we don't, usually don't talk about and for that matter don't give much credence to, things like our attitudes towards suffering and, and what should they be and what are they and how do we understand God in terms of what he allows in our life. He writes about hearing God's word and but doing it, but not just doing it, being sure that it applies to us before we seek to apply it to the lives of others. He writes about prejudice and partiality and superficial judgments and how we do that as a natural part of our old life, but how it shouldn't be tolerated as a, a believer in Christ. <clears throat> Chapter two, verse one, you can't hold both, your faith in Jesus and that kind of partiality. He talked about faith that should be visible in behavior, that it, to say we have faith but it can't see it is not the kind of biblical faith God wants to develop in your life. And then we got to last week this, <clears throat> uh, this series of studies on the tongue. Fortunately, we'll finish that today. Oh man, we need to get done with it. Where James begins by giving us an illustration in verse one of a teacher and says, you know, it's not a good thing to try to hunt down or, or put yourself in a position as a teacher, realizing that the words that you speak, there'll be many, will have a greater condemnation from God, a greater judgment, because words carry with it responsibility, and they're tremendously powerful. And James went on in verse two, said, since we're all sinful, um, that's, a, that's the place of greatest stumbling. In fact, if somehow you can get a hold of your tongue, or if the Lord can, Everything else in your life will be easier to control because nothing is more difficult than the tongue. It's absolutely a runaway problem that the Lord wants to get a hold of. And so James spoke to us there in verse two about you know, needing to, to have the Lord take hold. He said that the tongue was a very small instrument, but much like a bridle in the horse's mouth or a rudder on a big ship, it can, it can wield great power, both for good and for evil. Now most of this is written in the, in the negative sense, you know, the, the destruction it can bring. And, and that's James's issue. He wants to deal with our hearts and how it applies to our lives in terms of our speech. But, but it's true in the converse as well. You know, with your mouth you can preach the gospel and people's lives can be eternally changed. You can bring peace and comfort and encouragement. So the, the, the tongue has tremendous power even though it is relentlessly you know, in a battle for, for control. And James goes on and he says that, you know, you can stumble in a lot of ways, but the speech has the, has the record for most offense capability, but also the most gain can be brought through it. There are very few scriptures in the Bible, this long 12 verses, that kind of graphically and relentlessly go after one issue. 
But this morning we want to finish what James has to say, beginning in verse 5, where James says the impact of the tongue cannot be overstated. Its power is an amazing thing, though we use it constantly and probably aren't that aware of it from time to time. It is something that we should indeed be aware of. So verse 5 says this, even so, and he had spoken last week about the smallest of the tongue in relation to the greatness of its effect. Even so, the tongue is a very little member and yet it can boast great things. See how great a forest a little fire can kindle. The tongue is a fire. It is a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set amongst our members that it defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire by hell. Now those aren't, those aren't easy words to read. The tongue has glorious potential when yielded to the Lord, but as a little member, it can do tremendous damage. And, and notice James makes the comparison between little and great in verse five. It is little in the sense of size. It is great in terms of effect. It's, it's destruction or destructive potential is unmeasured. One spark and the whole, per, the whole forest can burn down. It was October the 8th, 1871 at 8.30 in the evening on a Sunday night when Mrs. O'Leary's cow knocked over the lantern in the barn. Two days later, three and a half miles of Chicago suburb had been burned to the ground. 100,000 people, no houses. 17,000 buildings destroyed. 300 people dead, $400 million in damage, which was a lot 145, 150 years ago. We live in Southern California, so I think we're pretty aware of, of wildfires. If you've been watching the news and the, the destruction in Australia, it's just phenomenal what a little fire can begin, a, a lightning strike. James says here in verse six, our tongues have that kind of capacity. Our words have that kind of capacity. So our words can start fires. One word, tremendous destruction. If your heart and your life is not submitted to the Lord, your mouth is fair game. We can become spiritual arsonists. You know, a couple of cross words become a raging inferno. A good marriage becomes a divorced home, a broken home, a family split. Churches are divided, friends are divided. Little smoldering, a spark becomes this big flame. And the enemy can't wait to use your words to destroy God's work, to destroy your reputation, to destroy the work of God through your life. When Solomon began to write some of the things in Proverbs, in chapter 26, he concentrated on, on speech. He wrote in verse 20, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. So where there's no tailbearer, strife ceases. A, char a charcoal is to a burning coal as, as wood is to a fire. And that's what a contentious man is to strife. The words of a tailbearer are like tasty trifles. They go down into the innermost part of your body. They are like fervent lips on a, with a wicked heart or earthenware that has been covered in silver. He who hates disguises it with his lips. He lays up deceit within himself. He speaks kindly, but don't believe him. There are abominations in his heart. His hatred is covered by deceit. His wickedness will be revealed, though, before the congregation. Who digs a pit will fall in it who rolls a stone will have it roll on him. A lying tongue will be crushed and a flattering mouth will bring ruin. It's amazing if you read through the Bible, everything the Lord has to say about this little tongue of ours. You would think, you know, he'd cover more important topics. No, 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 this is pretty much as important as it gets. And as you read through the scriptures, it just begins to amaze you. When the Lord wrote to the children of Israel through Jeremiah the prophet in chapter nine, and they weren't doing well. The Lord said through Jeremiah, I wish my head was filled with water so that my eyes could be a fountain of tears weeping day and night for my people who don't 
trust one another, who lie with their tongues, who wear the, themselves with iniquity, who destroy. And he pointed out that one of the problems for the nation in their sin was the words that were coming out of their mouth and the destruction that was coming with it. A spark can turn into a fire. When, when Solomon wrote in Psalm, uh, Proverbs 16, he said in verse 27, it is the lips that will be like a burning fire. Consider your words that way. You're walking around tender grass and tinder and, and then you speak and then you walk off, but you left behind a fire. When we are saved, when we come to the Lord, God takes hold of our speech and seeks to use it for good. One of the last comments in the book of Malachi, chapter three, was that the Lord listened in to the conversations of his people. And he wrote a book of remembrance before himself of the things that he heard them say. Now that's a book you wanna be in. As you begin to speak of the Lord, and, the Lord said, and then he said he loved me and he, he serves me, he wants, to, he wants to follow me. That's a book, you don't wanna be in that other book. But that's not a bad book to find yourself in. But that can only be accomplished by the, the work of God's Holy Spirit. Unless the Lord has your heart, the devil has your mouth. I got this idea that we should make little miniature fire extinguishers for our keychains. <laughs> Maybe that would remind us, oh yeah. I think it was Washington Irving who said one time, a sharp tongue is the only edge tool that grows sharper with use. Solomon wrote, he who has knowledge will spare his words. The Lord will listen. The understanding man will have a calm spirit. A fool wouldn't even be accounted wise if he just keeps his mouth shut. Which I think is where we got the old expression, I'm gonna be quiet and just have people think I'm a fool, than to open my mouth and remove all doubt. That's a biblical saying. You heard it here first. So until the redeemed heart gets the upper hand on the mouth, our mouth is not helpful, it's destructive. So how'd you do this week? Verse six, our tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. My goodness. The word iniquity is the typical word for unrighteousness, which means things that God hates or he will not accept or behavior or attitudes or words or, or, or all that, that don't line up with his will. It's the antithesis of doing the right thing. And the word world in terms of variety. There's a million ways to sin with your mouth. You can lie, you can gossip, you can become angry or bitter or hateful or resentful. Or resentful. Whatever comes out of that heart that's not yielded, your mouth will, will oftentimes put it first on display. The tongue is so set among our members, we read, that it can defile the whole body. It's a small little tongue, but it affects every part of us. If you're a good carpenter, you may never get a job again if your mouth alienates you. A singer can make himself unwelcome. An actor can become hard to deal with. A friend cannot be trusted. A boss speaks out of both sides of his mouth. Our tongues bring havoc, bring ruin. And it's a, it's a battle we face. One bad-mouthing saint can quickly taint the reputation of a church, <clears throat> of the gospel. <laughs> no matter how well you are intended, too many words in the wrong direction can negate every spiritual endeavor and influence that you desire. Notice James doesn't beat around the bush. He, does, he just hits you right in the head. It sets on fire the course of nature, and it is a fire set by hell. The word course is the word for wheel. <clears throat> the course of the word nature is the word for life. James's point is that everything is connected. <laughs> you, if your mouth is out of order, it'll spread everywhere that you, you know, would like to keep it from. Your mouth can offend in every circle, at every place. It leaves devastation behind. It can bring wholesale disaster. This little tongue. 
Years ago, I remember reading a book about the consequences of sin. And this guy wrote a book about the domino effects, how sin can't be isolated to you. But he wrote in one chapter, when a husband comes home from work and he's frustrated. And in his frustration, he yells inadvertently at his wife, who turns and scolds her son, who kicks his little sister, who hits the cat with his choy, who scratches the toddler, who tears the head off the Barbie doll. He said, you just can't stop it. Sin just runs rampant. Same thing with our words. Until the Lord harnesses us, our mouths are gonna fight against us. And notice the source of the fire, verse seven, six, is hell itself. How many of you have suffered the result of someone saying the wrong thing? Or you've had someone say, well, I didn't mean what I said. And, and if you know me, my heart and my, and my hands and my, my, my head are far better than, than my words. But they're, they're, you can't separate them, you can't isolate them. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, he said, let your speech always be with grace. Season your speech with salt that you may know how to answer. Isaiah in chapter 50 said of himself, the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned so that I might know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. And every morning when he wakes me, he has my ear and I hear from him and I learn from him so I might speak for him. That's what we need. Mouths that have been redeemed. Because it gets its fuel, if it isn't from the Lord, from hell itself. And by the way, that's a present participle, which would mean it's constantly being fueled, not by the Lord, not from heaven, but from hell. The word hell is the, is the Greek word Gehenna. If you've ever gone to Israel, the word Gehenna is a Chaldean word. Um, if you go to the Mount of Olives and you look across the Kidron Brook in the valley up to the Temple Mount, if you were to go left and head to the, the southeast portion of the walled city of Jerusalem, you would come as you turn from the Kidron Valley to the Hinnom Valley, Gehenim. That's really what the word means, the Valley of Hinnom. It was a place that before the Jews took the area, the Chaldeans, the Canaanites, worshiped Molech. They burned their children in the fire. When the Jews took the place over, they, they hated the place of this false worship and they turned that area into a dump where they burned their trash and they placed their dead animals. And it was a continual kind of burning trash heap. In fact, Jesus in the gospel 10 times points to Gehenna, which everyone understood and knew, to speak about the everlasting fires of hell that awaited the ungodly in judgment. James says, the tongue of the life of an unbeliever or one who is not surrendered, a believer not surrendered to the Lord, has a direct pipeline from hell. And there's plenty of fuel. There's no fuel shortage. Be careful. The ruin that your mouth can bring is, is unbelievable. It can ruin your witness, your stance, your reputation. Take it serious. Which is why we hate James. And why we love him. Your tongue can do more than a drop, drop bomb. It is demonically inspired by hell's fury. Think about that. When you gossip, and by the way, boy, do we put up with that, don't we? We love to hear or tell the latest. It is almost an acceptable conversation. Have you heard? No, what have you heard? Well, this is what they're telling me. I don't know. Keep it to yourself, though. Or the ever pious, I'm just telling you to pray about it. This isn't to go any further. Say to yourself, I have just become a tool of hell. Or innuendo, the cousin to gossip that functions by not saying anything. We just imply awkward silence, raised eyebrows, critical looks, freight from hell, or flattery. Flattery is the opposite of gossip. Gossip 
is what you'd never say to someone in, in, to their face. Flattery is what you'd never say behind their back because you don't believe it, but you'd like to just say it to them to their face. Hey, buddy, you're great. Mm, great huh? <laughs> Fires of hell. It's an ugly, long list. It's an eye-opening sentence. It is a horrible thing to think about. But more than your hands or your feet or your ears or your eyes, the tongue is what Satan seeks to control and it is capable of the most destructive things. Think about that every time you open your mouth. God help us. It is by far the most effective and, and efficient tool for God's glory, but also one that can be the most destructive. So James says in verse seven, every beast or every kind of beast and bird and, and reptile and creature of the field is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil. It is filled with deadly poison. See, James doesn't beat around the bush. I've seen killer whales leap on command. I saw a lion snuggle a, a trainer. I don't know how long that lasts, but I got out of there before things went wrong. I can teach my dog to, to bark and to sit, roll over, stay. I just can't tell my mouth to do that. It's out of my control. And James's point is that though God has given us rulership over the animal kingdom, Genesis uh, chapter 9, verse 2, I believe, he has put the fear of God into every creature and bird and fish. You can control them. The tongue, due to its source in hell and its attachment to the evil heart, needs God to be tamed. You can't tame it. And the word tame means to force behavior by, or, or to cause behavior by, by force. I realize that my dog doesn't like me. He likes what I give him. If we clean up the dishes after dinner, he goes sits in the kitchen like he wants to hang out with us. But the minute the dishes are gone and there's no more hope of food, he's somewhere else. Hey, come over here. No, you got nothing for me. I get a cookie. My best friend sits on my lap, rolls over, barks here, shakes my hand. Great. No cookie. I might as well be dead. It doesn't matter. He is trained by force. But that can't work for me. It can't work for my tongue. My, my, my human nature has fallen. Sin has taken over. Hell is on fire. An animal needs training. Man needs a new heart. And to that extent, your, your tongue needs to be redeemed. When, when Jude wrote about the, the false teachers in his day, he said of them in, in, in verse 10 of, of Jude that, that these men were, were, were like natural brute beasts, almost worse than animals. What they do naturally, they corrupt themselves. <laughs> That's us without the Lord's in our life. We need to have him do a work. Only God can master the tongue, make all things new. Notice in verse 8, James says, it is an unruly evil. The word unruly means to be ungovernable. Nothing can control it. You can count to 10 all you like. There, there's never going to be an 11, and then a 20, and then a 30. I've been trying this week. This is impossible. No real victory unless the Lord takes over. How accurate is speech to Jesus... It is so accurate as an evaluator and as a revealer of the condition of your heart that Jesus said there in Matthew chapter 12, out of the good treasure of a man's heart, he will bring forth good things. While out of an evil heart, a man will bring forth evil things. And then he says this, so every idle word which you speak will be brought to account in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. In other words, if the heart is right with God, the, the, the speech is going to support it. Not always. We're, we're struggling and wanting to walk by God's Spirit, but we'll be headed in that direction. But until that happens, verse 8 says, our tongues are filled with deadly poison. 
You know, the problem with poison is it usually works secretly, slowly, unnoticeably, without taste, without color, and once you discover you've been poisoned, oh no, it's too late. Family is ruined. Relationships die. Churches split. The tongue has done its work, and Satan couldn't be happier. Look, we would never bring a hungry lion in here and have him run around so you could pet him. Or put a bunch of deadly snakes on the ground at your feet. Look to be sure, I'm pretty sure we're all right. But yet somehow we just come in here with our tongues and slaughter one another. The tongue does its evil work almost imperceptibly. Verbal venom does the work of the devil. And, and James sees it among the church. He's not talking about the world here. You would expect it from there. It's in the church that we need victory. So here's his application, verse 9. With our tongues, we bless God and our Father and use it to curse men who are made in the similitude or in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring also bring forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. James's application is much like it is in every place that we've read. We as God's people should not endure or entertain the hypocrisy that the flesh would like to impose upon us. Shouldn't put up with it anymore. We have on the one hand, you know, hell induced fire from our mouths through our tongues. And on the other hand, we're singing worship songs and singing praise the Lord. Isn't God good? Hey, screw you. <laughs> Same words. Just can't let it go on. James said it in chapter two, verse one. You can't live with your partiality. He said it in verse 14 of chapter two. You can't have faith without works. And James says, he has uh, observed the, the contradictions in the church. We bless God, we curse men. His point is always the same. We need victory spiritually over the destructive ways of our flesh. And, and he says, my brethren, these things are not to be this way. So why do we tolerate it in our own lives? You know what you might want to say to somebody the next time they want to tell you something? Do my ears look like trash cans? Then quit dumping in them. You want to help someone do well? Walk away when they want to tell you a story. Verse 10, though, James admits that it's happening. He uses the word we. He puts himself in part of the solution. His, 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 his last words in verse 11 or 12 verse, you can't have it both ways. Your source is either the, the pit of hell or the, the power of God's spirit. When Isaiah was serving as a young prophet, he looked up to King Uzziah as really the man of God. And I think his young spiritual life was, was centered about a king that he had great respect for. But one day, King Uzziah died, and Isaiah found himself having to look to the Lord without a filter. If you read chapter six of the book of Isaiah, you find Isaiah's response. He, he looked up, he saw the Lord, and for the first time, maybe in that light, he saw himself. The first words out of his mouth were, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people that are exactly the same. The first step to always having victory over these things is to confess that you have a problem, to admit <laughs> that you could use some work. He, he goes to the Lord for cleansing, Lord help me. You read in Isaiah six about a seraphim, an angel, flying over to the, the coals in front of the altar and taking a coal off the fires before the Lord and placing them on Isaiah's lips and declaring to him, your words are clean now. And God cleansed him from his sin. The Lord then said to Isaiah, can I send you to speak? And Isaiah 
made himself available to the Lord. He started recognizing his sinful mouth. He asked God to cleanse him, but then he made a vow to make his voice available for the Lord to use. Lord, use me for your glory. Start a fire in me that brings life. The two on the road to Emmaus that met with Jesus on the afternoon of the resurrection. When the Lord left, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? While he walked along the way and he opened to us the scriptures. So what can you do when your mouth is out of control? I think you admit you have a problem. You ask the Lord to forgive you and then you surrender your speech to him. Lord, I wanna use my mouth for good. Better I say nothing than to be a tool of the enemy. One of the things that you'll read about the, Pro, uh, the Proverbs 31 woman is that she opens her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She had surrendered herself to the Lord. So watch your words, be conscientious. It's awful to watch your words. Try it this week. I don't want to be Satan's tool, do you? God has great things for us to accomplish. We live in a world of words that just kill. Wouldn't it be amazing to send out a bunch of Christians into the world who bless? Even when you have to speak the truth, you can do it in love. Bring the gospel of salvation. I love what Paul said, you know, how can they call on him in whom they've not believed. And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how will they hear unless a preacher be sent? How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those preaching the gospel of peace, bringing good tidings of things to come. That could be us. Encouraging words. Worshiping the Lord. So, Watch your mouth this week. Try it again. You'll do too well today. You've just come from church. Bless those who pull out in front of you. <laughs> who almost back into you. Who see you waiting and yet walk really slow. You know what I'm saying. And understand this, the enemy has a vested interest in your mouth. If the Lord doesn't have your heart, he'll have your mouth. Don't be a tool of the enemy. Be God's tool. Next week, more dilemmas. <laughs> Father, thank you this morning for your word to us and how, how blatant, really, and how... how moving the thought that, Lord, we have so much to work on in terms of surrendering our hearts and our mouths to you and how casual we are with so many words. And Lord, we confess to you that we want to do better. We want to honor you more. We want, we want you to be glorified in what we say, how we say it. Father, this morning, may you help us to just take it seriously and to realize how powerful and how effective our words can be as we share your word, as we, we encourage one another, as we speak words seasoned with salt and with grace, edifying words, unwilling to participate in the cesspool of the Gehenna fires. If this morning you don't know the Lord, I can say this to you, you'll never have victory over your words and one day you will not have victory over your life because we are sinners who need a savior and our hearts are bound to this dark world and until the Lord comes and, and he moves into your heart by the Holy Spirit and he forgives you your sin and then empowers you to live for him you have no chance, no hope of overcoming but God doesn't want to leave you there. He wants to save. His desire is that all of us would be saved. He wants to come live in us, to take us as his own. If you haven't received him today, you can come and pray with one of the pastors and, 
And the Lord will <laughs> answer your prayer if you call upon his name. And he'll save you as he saved us. And then he'll begin the work of delivering you from Satan's influence and power. For the rest of you, join me in my misery and ask the Lord to keep you aware of what you say. Shall we stand?